afternoon. Welcome to a beautiful day in Washington, D.C. It's certainly a historic day. We're so happy to have everybody here with us today. I know we are um, just really thrilled here in the D.C. area that we are um, celebrating inauguration today, and I hope everybody had a chance to see the uh, speeches and all the pageantry this morning and the beautiful ceremony last night here in Washington. Um, it's really been a, a wonderful week and what a great day to um, top it off with an incredible webinar. <laughs> so we're glad that you took some time out of your day today to join us. Welcome. If we could pull the slides up for a moment, that'd be great. I know we're still waiting for some folks to join us. So we're going to give everybody a moment or two to log on. Really excited to have everybody here today in Washington. I hope you're um, enjoying beautiful weather wherever you are around the country. It's just wonderful to have such an optimistic day here in Washington after a rough start to the year. And we're really glad that you're here with us today. We are going to focus on one of my favorite topics today, patient engagement. Um, and specifically around COVID-19 and some of the new strategies that have emerged from COVID-19. I think we all know kind of the trajectory of healthcare has changed somewhat in the last 12 months. And certainly there's been a lot more engagement to patients and from patients and all different ways of thinking about this. So we're gonna dive into that topic a little bit today. So delighted to have everybody here today. Um, before we jump in, I've got a couple of housekeeping items. And I just wanna run through a few items. So if I could get the next slide. Thanks. So as hopefully you guys know, I'm Jen Kovach-Bordnick. I'm the CEO of the eHealth Initiative and Foundation here in Washington, D.C. And I'm also delighted to have with us here today Anna Basovich, who's the Vice President of Customer Success at Arcadia. We've got an incredible program today. We're also really fortunate we're going to have with us today Mackenzie Bissett, who's the Director of Operations from Lurie Children's Pediatric Partners, Jennifer Palello who is the Senior Director of Quality and Population Health with the Community Health Plan of Washington. We've got an incredible program here from you today. We're gonna to hear all about um, how people are using patient outreach to improve patient engagement. We're gonna hear insights from a health plan that's out there in the field right now doing this. And I think you're gonna be really impressed with um, what's going on right now in the field. A lot of learning, a lot of lessons learned. Um, and really some wonderful information that, that could tr be transferable to your organizations. Um, so glad that you're here with us. If we go to the next slide. So for those of you who are not familiar with the eHealth Initiative and Foundation, we are a nonprofit here in Washington, D.C., celebrating our two decades, 20-year anniversary this year. We do education, advocacy, and thought leadership, and hopefully you've seen some of our work. Um, and if not, you'll see it soon, because if you're in this program today, it means you're on our list. So you're going to start hearing all about the wonderful work that we're doing. Next slide, please. We work with um, companies across the spectrum of healthcare, and this is just a sampling of some of the organizations that we work with. We work primarily at the executive level, payers, providers, uh, clinicians, hospitals, um, labs, vendors, uh, pharmaceutical groups, pharmacies, really anybody who's engaged in patient care and wellness. And we're trying to figure out how do you use innovation and technology to improve that patient experience? And, and what a great topic today that we're gonna jump into. If you don't see your company's name listed up there, it means that you're not working with us right now. And I would encourage you to reach out to myself or Sarah or 1A through the chat feature today and find out who, how you can get involved in our work. I can go to the next slide, please. So we work on a number of different critical topics and really our work is to dive into these critical topics with executives around the country, help them understand what works, what doesn't work, share learnings, um, do research in each of these four critical areas. What we're focused on right now in 2021 is looking at consumer privacy for health data. We've got a wonderful project going on with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, where we're developing a framework for health data for consumers. Um, would love to have your involvement in that. Again, feel free to reach out to us. We do an extensive amount of work around virtual care, and we're gonna hear a little bit about some of the ways that can happen with patient engagement today. Uh, we do a number of um, activities and webinars and research reports looking at social determinants of health and artificial intelligence, all the different ways to really use that health information and data to improve care. And then finally, really, the last 12 months has been 
focus significantly on COVID-19 and best practices and what's happening to really respond to this global pandemic right now as we've all had to kind of shift and think about things differently as we've moved forward. So those are the critical issue areas that we work in right now and hopefully you'll join us for some of our programs and research and reports. Next slide. This is just a sampling of some of the programs because we're a nonprofit, all of our programs and webinars, slides, reports are all available on the internet free of charge. Our website is ehidc.org. We have a magnificent online eHealth Resource Center where you can look up all of these different programs that have already passed. If you miss them, feel free to browse, send them to your colleagues. Um, the other wonderful thing about our resource center is you are able to post your own programs and reports. So if you have done work in the field and would like to share it, um, we encourage you to do that by going to our resource center, ehidc.org and sharing that. But please take advantage of um, the incredible um, forum that's available for you to share with others. Next slide. Some of the work that we did over the last year, this is a sampling of some of the publications. Um, as I mentioned, we've done a lot of work looking at social determinants of health, health disparities, um, different ways to reach out to patients um, using telehealth and virtual care. Um, I encourage you to go and download these reports. Again, these are free of charge and um, available to you and the general public to use. Next slide. A couple of exciting forums and webinars coming up next week. We've got a great program. Oh, we don't have them listed here. We have a great program um, next week looking at virtual care. We have a wonderful program looking at privacy policy next week on the 26th, 27th, and 28th. Um, we've got a wonderful um, program looking at um, new policy with the new administration coming in. And I encourage everybody to sign up. And that's where you see the EHI annual member meeting right there listed. February 3rd, we're gonna be talking about how to scale virtual care, um, best practices and lessons learned from leaders. And then we're gonna be looking at robotic process of automation, which is gonna be really interesting on February 17th. And then finally, the information blocking final rule, the impact on HIEs coming up the 23rd. Oh my goodness, one day, we have a lot of programs coming up here. <laughs> Healthcare consumerism, eligibility. Well, you can see the whole list here, but I encourage you to join us again. Um, these are for the benefit of yourself and your colleagues and healthcare professionals. So feel free to share these broadly. Next slide. And last but not least, you are all currently muted right now, if you didn't know that already. I think everyone's familiar with the Zoom reality, um, but we do want to hear your questions and answers. And I know Anna and crew are going to take questions at the end of the presentations today. So please go ahead and submit your questions in that Q&A box there in the bottom. There's also a chat feature there if you're having technical difficulties. Do not put your questions in the chat box, um, your content questions, because we will not be able to find them there. But please put your Q&A questions there in that Q&A box at the bottom, um, and we will get to as many as we can today. So next slide. And last but not least, I really want to thank Anna and her team and Arcadia for um, joining us today. And as I mentioned, as a very small nonprofit, we are reliant upon the generosity and graciousness of groups like Arcadia who are willing to um, support programs like this. And I, Arcadia has done a significant amount of work in this area, and I think you're going to hear about that today. So we're really delighted to have them here with us today. And I'm going to turn it over to you, Anna. So take it away. Awesome. customers be successful in value-based care. We do this by helping organizations assemble the most comprehensive and timely data set for value-based care that's sourced from uh, EHR systems, health plan claims, labs, and ancillary data sources. Uh, we run that data through a business rules engine that calculates quality measures, risk and impactability scores, and other KPIs, all the metrics that are critical for informing leaders in the value-based care ecosystem of their opportunities for improvement. And we present those insights through analytics and reporting, as well as a series of point of care tools that are designed to help frontline caregivers act on the opportunities to drive performance in their contracts. 
Uh, and one of the ways that we do that is through patient engagement. And we're here today because that's one of many things that became more challenging in 2020. Uh, we saw healthcare organizations lose in-person visits, which has really been the primary way of connecting with patients and maintaining and building that relationships. And we know that patients faced great barriers to engaging in care. Uh, we saw a mix of information about what's safe and what isn't. Many offices were closed for parts of the year and many patients faced financial challenges. And we saw the impact of this. Uh, we saw patients get less preventative care. Uh, vaccinations in particular stood out as something that really fell behind last year. Uh, we saw less chronic disease management. We even saw less acute care as fewer patients went to the ER uh, or the hospital for emergent conditions. So faced with this, uh, a lot of healthcare providers as well as health plans have had to step up their patient engagement efforts and put new strategies in place. Uh, for many of our customers, that's included uh, public health campaigns and, uh, focused on increasing awareness around COVID-19 and how to stay safe, uh, and outreach efforts to drive flu vaccinations to uh, reduce those avoidable hospitalizations and make sure that our hospitals were able to deal with the influx of COVID-19 cases. We saw a big focus on care gap closure, uh, bringing patients in for well visits for those childhood immunizations, cancer screenings, chronic disease management. And we saw organizations share more resources with their patients, whether that was financial resources for underprivileged populations, um, guidance around access to care through telehealth, and hotlines for behavioral health support. To execute that at scale, uh, we relied heavily on automation, uh, tools that algorithmically identify patients and automate the delivery of those messages. This is what allowed our customers to easily identify asthmatic patients for air quality warnings during the summer forest fires or high risk patients based on condition histories for targeted outreach around COVID. In the past year, we've sent over 2 million texts and we were able to get especially high patient reach rates due to our ability to leverage comprehensive data sets from multiple practices as well as health plans. Some of the campaigns that have had the largest impact on population health were focused around preventative care as we helped more diabetic patients um, have their chronic conditions managed. Uh, we saw, we helped more patients come in for cancer screenings and annual wellness visits, which we know is a huge tool in making sure that patient care needs can be addressed in a comprehensive manner. And as we're looking ahead, one of the th some of the things that our customers are thinking about is how to continue to offer support to patients as the pandemic continues, how to get patients in for vaccinations as those become available, make sure that patients know that vaccinations are safe and critical in getting us through the pandemic, uh, and also making sure that preventative care starts to get back on track as we start to return to normal. One of the big considerations as we think about this is equity in how this care is delivered. Uh, that means starting to account more for social determinants of health, meeting patients where they are and targeting outreach in different languages and ensuring that the communications are culturally sensitive. Uh, it means reporting that incorporates uh, all of those factors to ensure equitable distribution of healthcare resources. And it also means monitoring our algorithms for bias, uh, ensuring that when patients get selected for outreach or care management or are prioritized for uh, limited uh, visit slots that are available, that's not just based on who's had access to care in the past, but really focused on who, uh, who needs to receive that care most urgently. Think, and what that's looked like for you. Sure, thanks. Uh, thank you very much for having me. It's great to uh, virtually be here. Uh, my name is uh, Mackenzie Bissett. I'm from uh, Lurie Children's Pediatric Partners, uh, which is a clinically integrated network in Chicago. 
We uh, are owned by Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago, and we have uh, about a thousand physicians in our network, uh, 25 to, to 30% of which are uh, community pediatricians that own their own businesses. Uh, we have six contracts right now that cover about 140,000 kids. Uh, and our mission statement is uh, here on the right. So our, our goal is uh, to improve the health and well being of, of children and teens. Next slide. So, just to give you a little bit of background, uh, you know, I think everybody knows that, that COVID uh, does not affect. Um, the pediatric population uh, quite the same as it does the adult population. So um, with the emergence of COVID, pediatricians, especially in our network, really struggled to stay in business. Um, patients and families were afraid to come in. Uh, Chicago and the rest of Illinois were in total lockdown. Um, no school, no sports, which are, are two big reasons why kids uh, go to the pediatrician, you know, school and sports physicals nothing was open. Um, so the, the pediatricians really had to shift from you know, focusing on their business goals and improving the quality of care, focusing on practice transformation to focusing on uh, where can I get PPE? Um, where, where are their testing resources? Where am I sending kids? You know, instead, of, instead of meeting quality metrics and closing gaps in care. So once the, the PPE issue was, was generally under control and practices in our network got more comfortable with their financial situations, whether it be from the, the payroll protection loan or they you know, were able to stabilize their staffing models and testing became more mainstream, they began asking us for help looking uh, at gaps in care reports that, that we have available in Arcadia to try to identify kids to call. You know, how, can we, how can we generate some business? And we realized obviously as a network that we had to shift our focus to try to you know, get patients re-engaged in their care. And we have done patient outreach in the past. It's primarily been telephonic, uh, but what we found is that texting outreach is really what families prefer over phone calls, at least the millennial parent generation. Uh, they're less invasive. Uh, and easier to configure than telephonic outreach. And it doesn't really require as much from the practice, um, which has been a, a significant historical barrier for us. Uh, and then the last piece is that we, we really, so we're still in our implementation technically um, of the Arcadia system, and we hadn't done patient outreach uh, yet in the system. And so um, the Arcadia uh, outreach platform really uh, is pretty easy to configure relative to systems that we've used in the past. And so we were able to kind of jump into it quickly and, and get a campaign launched. Next slide. Our first campaign um, was only a, a few practices, just kind of a, an initial pilot um, and included text about the importance of coming in despite what was going on uh, with COVID. And the focus was really about re-engaging patients and families. We wanted to tie them back to their pediatrician. Um, and so we, we also paired that with some marketing material for pediatricians about the safety of their offices. So sanitizing practices, how they were restructuring their waiting rooms. Um, some of them were separating sick and well visits, you know, having potentially COVID positive patients come in in the morning and, you know, well visit appointments in the afternoon. And then this marketing also focused on the dangers of missing checkups. And so we were, um, through Arcadia actually, getting a lot of data from EDs uh, in our market that obviously patients were coming in less frequently, but when they were coming into the ED, they were sicker. And it's because they weren't getting these preventative care visits that they should have. And a lot of them have chronic diseases that weren't being managed because again, they weren't coming in to see their pediatrician. So, you know, asthma patients, diabetes patients were showing up much sicker in the ED. And I think with that, that first campaign, we had, uh, we have a little bit of data, but I think 11 or 12% of the patients that we outreach to in that pilot um, made an appointment within the first week uh, after getting the outreach, which is, uh, you know, historically pretty good for us. And then I believe about half of them who had received the text uh, had an encounter with their pediatrician within three months, which is, again, you know, uh, that's, that's pretty significant for us. And then the second campaign was more focused on flu shots. 
uh, especially, you know, important given the dangers of COVID. This was more general language. Uh, and when we develop gaps in care lists for outreach, we typically use our quality measures. And the flu uh, measure is our largest denominator. So we try to use that as much as possible when outreaching to patients. Uh, and so this campaign, again, came from the practice, just like our first campaign. Uh, instead of the CIN, which is a, a really nice Arcadia feature, families seem to be more responsive to that. We've, we've done uh, outreach campaigns from the CIN, but it, it uh, tends to create confusion because most families don't really know what a CIN is. Um, we in Chicago have a very competitive network um, and, and market. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of the patients that are attributed to our pediatricians have never been seen at Lurie Children's. So they get a text from Lurie Children's uh, and they call and want to know how we have their data. So, you know, kind of HIPAA concerns, if you will. Uh, and then the third campaign was primarily payer driven. Um, and we're seeing more of this in 2021. Um, so I think the, the texting outreach will definitely be uh, expanded. Uh, we were provided a gaps in care list uh, by the payer, and they were offering additional bonuses for closing gaps related to overdue well visits, which, as we know, ultimately improves immunization rates that, we're, that we are behind on for 2020. Uh, and we decided to avoid using COVID language for this campaign, and, and we've kind of gone back and forth, you know, should we include COVID in our outreach campaigns right now or, or kind of move on and try to focus on, okay, let's just get these kids in for, for well visits and not try to kind of bring that up again, if you will. And then next slide, please. And so looking ahead to, to 2021, definitely a new focus um, and payer requirements uh, related to social determinants of health. We, we conducted an analysis using claims data uh, in Arcadia and uh, looked at our quality measure performance across race, ethnicity, and language, and found, unfortunately, statistically significant differences in some of the categories. Um, and so, you know, we, we have to target those groups uh, with significant differences and measure compliance. And the plan will be to develop outreach campaigns to try to close those gaps. Um, I would also say that, that because of the campaigns that we've done so far this year, um, or at late in 2020, there's definitely more pediatrician interest due to the success of those, those campaigns and the ease of texting. And they're not really getting complaints from parents like they did with telephonic outreach. Um, and then just kind of the, the slow season, uh, you know, the pediatricians are, are definitely seeing things slow down with, you know, without flu being as much of an issue this year. And so it's really, you know, to try to drum up some business. Um, and then just one more thing to add about texting outreach, it, it does provide a little bit of uh, flexibility with language. And so with the telephonic outreach and the, the vendor that we used previously, uh, outreach was only available in English and Spanish. And in Chicago, we have lots of languages uh, that the patients and families are, are using. And so the, the texting really provides an opportunity to get our interpreter involved and, and try to use um, you know, other languages in, in our patient outreach. And next slide, I think I'm turning it over to uh, Jen. You are, thanks, Mackenzie. Oh, hello, everyone. Good morning from the West Coast. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, excited to share a little bit about Community Health Plan of Washington, um, who we are and um, how we partnered with Arcadia for our outreach efforts in 2020 and how um, lessons learned from our campaigns have, have started to inform a lot of the outreach efforts that are currently underway. Um, so first, a little bit about Community Health Plan of Washington and, and who we are. Um, we are a local Washington-based not-for-profit health plan. We have over 30 years of experience uh, working in, in, this, in the state. Uh, we <clears throat> uh, serve primarily Medicaid and Medicare members. We've got over 250,000 members across the state. Um, we were founded by 20 federally qualified community health centers, and those uh, community health centers are located across the entire state of Washington. And those of you familiar with our 
our um, state know that you know we've got Seattle on the on the west side, very heavy uh, population, dense population. As you move east, um, it's less so and and more rural in nature, um, where a lot of our CHCs uh, are located. Uh, next slide. Great, so everything CHPW uh, does is rooted in our, our mission. Our mission is to serve our members and our, our community. That is at the heart of everything that we do. Um, we approach our work in a flexible and dynamic manner. Um, and since our staff is local and based across the region in this and the, uh, across the state in the regions we serve, um, we're able to provide this whole person member centric uh, care that supports all of our members' needs, um, which is really a tribute to our partnerships with our CHCs and our, our growing enrollment across the state. Next slide. Great. There we go. Uh, so here's, here's the, the heart of it. Um, we had two outreach strategies that ran simultaneously uh, throughout 2020. First, we had the plan specific uh, driven initiatives. Um, and then uh, we had outreach in partnership with our 20 community health centers uh, across the state. So um, at any given time, we could have a plan uh, campaign going and then a specific uh, outreach campaign with members at a particular CHC. Um, and we did so, um, obviously the plan uh, outreach was focused specifically on CHP members, but the CHC campaigns included all of their members, not just CHP uh, members, which I think is a good distinction and, and um, goes to how we support our community health centers. Um, and, and then I should note often some of these uh, CHC specific campaigns were translated into multiple languages. Um, typically at the plan, we did English and Spanish, but as we worked with our partners, we translated into multiple different uh, languages. Um, for example, we did a campaign with one of our CHCs and translated some messages into Somali. So um, that was um, a good campaign that offered a lot of learning experiences for us. Um, so first off, we accomplished our strategies by using Arcadia's robust platform that integrates more recent contact and demographic data with um, our CHC EHR uh, data and claims data. Um, so this allowed us a, a, a great foundation for approaching and, and reaching all of our, our members and all of our CHC uh, patients. Um, we supported this effort by um, adding additional services offered by the plan, such as wellness calls. So at the begin beginning of the pandemic in March, you may remember it kind of started off uh, in Seattle. Uh, we called all of our members personally to check in and see how they were doing. And that generated uh, referrals to our uh, community services team uh, that uh, connects members with social services and also our care management team where appropriate. Um, our campaign started in March, as I mentioned, when the pandemic was in full swing in Seattle and it consisted of, you know, at first general education about what was going on. Um, we did some benefit reminders and that prompted additional referrals to that community programs team linking our members with social services. Uh, and then it evolved over time into directing them to testing locations. We had a number of CHCs that were doing uh, drive-by testing. And so we were able to configure our outreach to um, certain populations um, assigned to that community health center and target specific languages within that um, targeted area. Um, let's see, and then later in the year, um, as you might remember, uh, the Pacific Northwest suffered through a series of wildfires um, and smoke from these fires significantly impacted our air quality. I think Anna mentioned this earlier, but we had poor air quality for a number of weeks. And so using our Arcadia platform, we were able to quickly deploy um, a campaign to all of our members with respiratory disease, reminding them to make sure they had their medications handy, um, make sure that they could, you know, stay inside and, and avoid prolonged exposure outside. 
Um, and then finally, as Mackenzie uh, touched on a little bit, most of you know, a side effect from this uh, pandemic has been a sharp decline in preventative and chronic disease care. Um, we deployed a well child exam reminder that um, included members that not only needed a well child exam, hadn't had one in the year, um, and were also missing immunizations. And again, we were able to look at uh, different uh, regions uh, that our CHCs serve and translate those messages into the different languages. Um, our, the Arcadia platform really allowed us to have that timely access to our population. Um, we could really quickly deploy those outreach campaigns for those targeted uh, and specific populations, which was really handy. And I think Mackenzie talked about it. You know, we're not new to outreach, but um, you know, typically I've done telephonic outreach and a little bit of email outreach. So um, enabling these text messages um, and outreach campaigns were really, really helpful for us and allowed us to um, reach a significant number of our members. And I think the next slide um, shows some of our uh, outcomes. So as I mentioned earlier, we had um, over 10 campaigns in 2020 and, and talked about the various types of campaigns. Um, and we were really pleased about our overall success rate of 77%, meaning our messages were successfully delivered to 77% of those that we um, sent a text message to, which um, for us was, was pretty high. As I mentioned, we typically had done um, telephonic or email and did not um, enjoy such a high success rate. So um, it was a, a huge improvement over past outreach efforts for us. Um, and really allowed, it, allowed us to, you know, test that ability and, and tweak the campaigns over time for continued success. So we are in the process of taking our lessons learned from 2020 and applying it to our COVID vaccination outreach efforts, which are currently underway, um, like most of you probably. Um, I think one of the biggest lessons for us um, was a, being able to utilize the current contact and demographic data located in our Arcadia platform and match it up with our claims data. Um, that gave us a real boost for targeting our, our specific communities in need and tailoring, tailoring those messages in a, and, and delivering them in a way that um, is responsive uh, for our members um, and, and very timely for our members, which really gave us a boost this year. And we're looking forward to um, continuing that in, in 2021 as we roll out COVID a vaccine education and awareness and, and where to go for testing. So with that, I'll pause. I know I'm sure there's probably lots of questions. So I'll toss it back to you, Anna. Thanks, Jen. Can folks hear me okay? I think now you were crackling earlier, but I think now you sound a little bit better. <laughs> I was crackling. Uh, it's a beautiful day. Uh, well, Jen, Mackenzie, thank you guys so much for talking us through uh, through your feedback. I've got a couple of questions. I'm seeing some starting to come in. Uh, folks in the audience, please don't hesitate to drop your questions in the Q&A. Uh, you know, I think the one that I'll start with is incredibly topical for most organizations that I talk to, which is uh, the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, we have a lot of patients, uh, and I think probably many of us and our families are wondering when they're going to be able to get vaccinated. Um, and plenty of folks are also worried about it. You know, there's been a lot of different information out there, and there's, you know, there's a lot of talk that, you know, has this, has this been tested for long enough? You know, do we, do we know what we're getting into as we rush out? How are you guys thinking about patient engagement around the vaccine? Are there particular messages that you're looking to put out to your patients? What does that look like? Go, you can go ahead, Jennifer. I mean, it's, it's uh, less relevant to pediatrics. I didn't, I didn't want to cut you off. Um, so uh, the joys of a webinar. Um, so, you know, we're really looking at uh, tailoring those communications for, for our members and partnering with the state. So, you know, I know every state has their rollout strategy plan. And so um, our messages are, are we're, you know, we're trying to collaborate with the state and, um, and providing that awareness of where to go for testing, um, or excuse me, vaccination 
based on the state's rollout strategy and they've got you know several different resources that we're connecting to so try not to replicate things but more um, tap into a lot of what the state is doing mm -hmm. and then in terms of engagement um, we are in the process of getting the communications preferences um, out to our members so we can really understand and track how our members want to be communicated with and um, you know for a plan I, I think that that at least for us I, you would think that that's you know kind of a, um, a, a step one to have um, but it's been a little bit of a struggle for us to get our arms around how do our members want to be communicated um, and you know which which mode and and set up our strategies accordingly so really working to define those communication strategies and preferences with our members and and build those outreach efforts uh, around that. Yeah, and, and we have a little bit more time to, to figure that out uh, because the vaccine isn't isn't recommended for children uh, yet. Um, however, I think there are some clinical trials that are that are starting up for uh, children and teens. Um, so certainly the outreach tool could be be part of that. Um, and then we are getting lists uh, from the payers of COVID positive patients or patients that are at high risk for uh, COVID and, and trying to you know, target those patients to make sure that they're able to get the preventative care that they need and are, are effectively kind of self-managing their chronic diseases. Yeah, I would, I would just add to that, um, Mackenzie, when you mentioned lists. Um, so we are using the Arcadia platform to configure our registries of high risk members, um, members that are um, upcoming in a, in a uh, new vaccination phase. So we're getting all of that staged and ready um, using our analytics platform, which has been really helpful. Um, and then pushing those lists out to our CHCs of course, they all, all have access to the same platform, but um, we're finding that the support from our teams and delivering those lists to them from the Arcadia platform has been really helpful. And then I think Arcadia actually has a, and I'm gonna forget the name of it, it's a, it's a COVID kit, if you will, um, that, that provides lots of different kind of um, ways to look at the data to, to help identify kids that are at high risk. Is that correct, Anna? Am I yeah. saying that correctly? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we do have we do have our COVID risk registry um, that's been used by many of our customers for the past few months in order to identify those higher risk patients. Uh, and many organizations have said, you know, for example, we're gonna we're gonna target our our highest risk bracket with nurse care management calls to make sure that there's really a good opportunity to dig in and talk through the patient's care overall, uh, and then potentially use some of the bulk messaging capabilities for, for other populations. So it's definitely been a big focus. Um, and we'll be rolling out more tools in the coming weeks as well, uh, as organizations are thinking about bringing patients in for those COVID vaccinations, um, helping folks get patients prioritized in accordance with the state and local guidelines. Uh, Jen, something that you mentioned was getting down to those member communication preferences. And there's a great question in the Q&A, which is that, you know, we get tons and tons of data between the claims and the clinical data. We've got the demographic information. We have patient histories, et cetera. Um, and the attendee is wondering about understanding personality so that communications can be more targeted and drive desired behaviors. And I'd love to hear a little bit from you and from Mackenzie next as well, uh, around kind of how, how you're thinking about targeting your communications in a way that's really gonna resonate with your members. Yes, that's a, that's a, great, a great question. Um, you know, certainly uh, we're utilizing the, the data, as I mentioned, the, con the contact and demographic data out of the Arcadia platform um, and engaging with our members through our um, member portal. And so putting a lot of those communications uh, there and, and adding the fact that they can change their communication preferences there and, and um, connecting it back to our Arcadia data is, is really at the, at the heart of our strategy. But also looking at that demographic data and um, configuring those messages to, to meet the needs of the members, you know, both uh, from a culture, culture standpoint, from a language standpoint, 
um, and just an overall diversity standpoint with the support of our CHCs um, who know the, these members the best, you know, what is the best way to, to meet those needs of the, of the members? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Uh, I wouldn't say that I have the answer. I think we're trying to find the answer at this point. We, in, in doing our social determinants of health analysis with the, the quality measure data in Arcadia, discovered that, you know, we're missing more than, I think, 40 to 50 percent of the demographic data. Now, we're, we're aggregating, you know, all of our claims data, um, as well as uh, data from 16 different EMRs, I think. So, you know, the, the, the data is a little bit messy. Um, and I think trying to to change the culture of our network to try to get pediatricians to just get comfortable asking those questions and collecting that data is we found to be our first step. Um, so at Lurie Children's, we do have a, a chief diversity and inclusion officer, and she's been very helpful with helping us identify resources to, to get out to the network about how to ask um, these questions and how to respond and what the answer choices should be, et cetera. And, and so I hope that over time, we will end up getting more of that data and then lean on her and our patient advisory committee at Lurie Children's to try to, you know, be culturally sensitive in, in what we're asking and as well as our, our patient outreach, um, but also make sure, you know, we're incorporating the, the right language that you know, patients and families. It makes sense to patients and families. It's a great point. Um, another really good question here is uh, around the capacity and the practices. And I have a feeling this is one that I've probably talked to both of you about at some point or another over the years. Um, and the, the attendees comment is that they get pushback on patient outreach due to concerns around the capacity to follow up on it, uh, particularly in reaching out to patients who might need community services in addition to medical. And uh, the questions here are around, you know, how, how do these platforms integrate with care coordination systems? What are good ways to support next steps? And I think the piece that I'd add to that is, you know, what, um, what, what is the right way to follow through on outreach after you've sent that first message? You know, how do we, how do we get how do we get prepared to catch those responses? Yeah, that is a great question. And um, probably something I should have, have mentioned earlier about one of the, the benefits of, of using the Arcadia Outreach is that we're able to um, real time almost um, control the output of messages. So our workflow was such um, that we partnered with our community health centers to have a lot of those broader messages for social services support come from the plan. Um, and in the message, they, you know, we listed our customer service number and um, or uh, web page, but um, a majority of our members contacted um, customer service if they needed assistance which would then warm transfer them to our community programs team, which um, connects them to social services real time. Um, and one of the first um, uh, beginning outreach efforts that we did, we just kind of, you know, let the floodgate open and, um, you know, real time I was getting a phone call saying, oh my God, we have so many so many phone calls, you guys need to slow down the outreach. And so it was great because I was able to, you know, contact Arcadia and say, hey, can we limit the amount of messages that go out each day? Because we are overwhelmed, especially back in, you know, March, April, when Seattle was getting really uh, hit really hard. Um, we just didn't quite know what to do. Um, so we were able to really um, control the number of messages that went out to our members, which then um, allowed our community programs team to handle the warm transfers in a much more manageable uh, pace, making sure everybody got connected to services. Yeah, we've, we have had um, issues with that in the past, more so with the telephonic outreach. Um, but, but as Jen said, uh, I think the, the texting outreach is definitely more easily configurable. Um, and you can kind of dial it back if a practice says, okay, you know, we're getting, we're getting too many patients calling, you know, in an hour to, to schedule an appointment. 
um, the nature of our of our outreach hasn't been so that they you know they can respond and request certain resources. But I will say that we are implementing the um, care management platform in Arcadia, and I think that will lead to a, a whole uh, new set of outreach uh, campaigns with our care coordination team, um, kind of as they become our disease management program and care coordination program become more familiar with with the capabilities. And then we do um, at the hospital have a have another vendor for um, community services, and so I think at this point, until we figure out um, you know, how to integrate that, that that's kind of where they go to identify resources for the pediatricians. Uh, that's awesome, you guys. It's, it's really a huge service to your patients and your members that those are all resources that are available. Um, and I think, you know, over, over the years, it's really become very apparent to all of our teams that those, those supplementary resources are just absolutely critical in supporting patients, we know that healthcare doesn't exist in a vacuum. Um, and I'd love to bring us back to social determinants of health. Uh, Jen, I know this is something that you, you and your team have done just a tremendous amount of work around. Um, Mackenzie, I know you mentioned earlier that, that this was an area where you guys were seeing certain discrepancies around, uh, around care gap closure. And I'd love to hear from both of you guys, Mackenzie, maybe we can start with you uh, around the way that your, that your organizations are thinking about social determinants of health uh, and how you're looking to, to really pull together and leverage this data. Yeah, I mean, so I think, as I mentioned, the first step uh, was, was trying to get pediatricians to, uh, in our network, to think about collecting this data and collecting it um, in an appropriate way, and then, you know, trying to figure out what we do with the data. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we, we've had uh, the payers as part of our 2021 contracts have come to us with um, an additional focus on social determinants of health and reducing health, health disparities. Um, they have different methods. So some of them are focused on, more focused on like implementing screening um, and then others are more focused on data analysis across quality measures, um, but it's it's becoming part of the quality calculation, which is a good thing, right? So so providers are now focusing on this. Um, I, you know, I think w once we close, are able to close the significant gaps in data, then again, you know, it's it's going to be about leaning on our social determinants of health steering committee at the hospital, our chief diversity and inclusion officer to try to figure out, you know, what do what do we do with that? So I, I think the the first step will be some sort of patient outreach campaign to target those populations um, in in the right way. Um, but I think you know we're we're unfortunately still in the beginning stages uh, of this work. Yeah, that, that's a, a fantastic question and, and one that um, is top of mind at our organization. You know, um, last year, well, I guess 2019 now, um, you know, we really started trying to capture this data in the community health center EHRs. And, um, you know, as I mentioned before, we have 20 community health centers. That means 20 different EHRs, um, different versions of EHRs. Um, and so we collaborated with them to start electronically capturing um, SDOH assessment data for the very purpose Mackenzie was talking about to identify, you know, those disparate populations and how we might tailor outreach to, uh, to them. Um, you know, 2020 derailed a lot of that, uh, not surprisingly, but um, we still were able to work with Arcadia to leverage what data we did have in our Arcadia platform. And, um, you know, plans are now to, to marry that with uh, a lot of the high-risk registries that we have access to and tailor our outreach for specific uh, underserved populations. Um, specifically linked to different community health centers uh, that we serve. So that, that is our overall strategy. Of course, you know, not all of the CHCs are uniformly ca capturing uh, SDOH data in their EHR, but that's one of the goals that we plan to pick up in 2021 and, and continue that, that data. You know, we've got a uh, social determinant registry in the Arcadia platform that we can nicely marry with our high-risk patients and our chronic disease 
uh, patients and and um, collaborate that with the outreach efforts that we're doing. So we plan to build upon that for 2021, definitely. That's awesome, you guys. It's obviously such a huge component of, you know, meeting patients where they're at, communicating with them in a way that makes sense for them and uh, and it's clear to them and also really addressing the concerns, uh, the concerns that they have. Um, Jen, the comment here is that if you solve how to get all CHCs to uniformly capture social determinants of health data in their EMRs, hopefully there'll be a webinar sharing the secrets. <laughs> and I can assure you guys that there will be. It's definitely, there's definitely an effort there uh, in driving that consistency and normalizing that data for sure. Yes, a big task. We're not, we're not all the way there yet. Um, I, I would say maybe almost half of our CHCs, uh, but we're, we're getting there. Well, I mean, and then you try to factor in, sorry, go ahead. No, go for it. <laughs> no, I was going to say, you know, Jen talked about 20 EMRs and we have 16. Trying to, you know, some of the EMR systems that are, are used by the practices are, are not um, fully supported. And so if you were, mm -hmm. you were to develop the social determinants of health screening in, in your hospital EMR and you want to try to push that out or implement it within these other EMR systems, you know, they don't have the support, they don't have the capacity to do that. And so it's, it is um, just a challenge at every level. Yes, and some of our CHCs fall into that exact category, and that has has been a struggle. But we've made some some small strides uh, with some partnerships with uh, some of those supporting entities, and hopefully, we'll be able to uh, further deepen our SDOH uh, data. Mm -hmm. It's a great point, and for what it's worth, for me, it's very reassuring that we're now having this conversation about SDOH, and we're not still talking about how to capture tobacco screenings and depression screenings in a standardized way, because we've crossed that bridge. Um, and we've got a really solid foundation of data uh, and process and you know all of the people process technology kind of triad um, of, uh, of helping these organizations move through those challenges and start to get more and more of that documentation in place so that we've got even more to build on here. Um, I'll keep an eye out and see if any more questions come through in the q and I've got a last one here, you know, uh, Jen, uh, you're, you're obviously with a Medicaid plan. Uh, Mackenzie, you're, you're more on the provider side with the CIN group. Um, one of the questions that that I frequently get in talking with, with customers and other organizations around outreach is, you know, well, are we going to be, you know, is this messaging they're already getting from someone else? And I, I often hear providers say, you know, well, what if the member's already getting this from their health plan? I, we don't want to bombard them with messages. And we sometimes get some of the same concerns from the plans as well. Um, you know, isn't, you know, why, why are we going to reach out to someone and tell them to go to the doctor? Is their doctor already doing that? Uh, I'd love to hear a little bit about uh, the opportunities here for plan provider coordination. Uh, and Jen, I'd love to hear from you how you've approached this with the CHCs. And then Mackenzie, I think hear from you as well around the, around the way that you guys are thinking about collaborating with your health plans on this. Yeah, great question. So, you know, wherever possible, we prefer the, the CHC to take lead on, on a message. Um, I think that that's you know, the member receives that a little bit better as coming from their provider rather than their health plan. Um, but then, as I mentioned earlier, there's certain um, messages that we can do better than um, the provider group, um, you know, connecting members to social services directly and providing that support uh, for those uh, members and to help out the CHC. So, um, you know, I, I think wherever, part, wherever possible, we like to partner with our community health centers um, and certainly are, are more sensitive knowing that the message is, is well received from, from the, the member when it's coming from the uh, provider. Um, we have had some um, instances where there's been uh, duplicate messages and, you know, for the most part, some of the members were like, hey, uh, I already heard about this, but thanks for checking in. You know, I appreciate I appreciate the the um, outreach. So uh, that that's been helpful. Not not to say that they've all reacted that way, but um, you know, wherever <laughs> possible, we try not we try not to cross messages and um, align them um, among a, a specific strategy for uh, 
a collaborative rollout. Yeah, so for us, um, there's definitely been a shift over the last five years or so with the commercial payers wanting us to do more of that. So I think, you know, five years ago, patients and families would get that redundant outreach. So, you know, the, the payer calls them and says, we want to enroll you in a program or we, you know, we think you should access this resource and we would be doing the same thing, uh, you know, after some time due to the claims lag. Um, but I think, you know, over time with the, the change in value-based contracting, I, they, they're expecting us to do more of that. So I think, you know, there's more, um, I wouldn't say bonuses, but I think there's more incentive for us to be providing those types of things. And so we, um, you know, I, I think even when we do outreach, we, as, as Jen sort of said, you know, it, it's very important for it to come from the provider. So even as a CIN, not only do they not want to hear from their insurer, they also don't necessarily want to hear from the CIN because they don't know what that is. So we, as much as possible, try to have our outreach coming from whatever outreach we do, try to have it come from the provider. So even if it's from, you know, our care coordination team or disease management team, it's usually, you know, in partnership with the, the pediatrician. It's, it's a really great point, Mackenzie. One of, the, one of the sort of studies that stood out the most to me recently in terms of how we, how organizations communicate about COVID in particular uh, and how groups like public health agencies in particular get that message through um, has been the fact that, you know, patients can hear the same information on TV day after day and hearing it from a trusted person, whether that's your primary care physician or a local community leader or somebody from a religious organization really makes a huge difference. Um, and there's certainly a lot to be said for making sure that these messages are being positioned appropriately. Um, and really a lot of data highlighting the fact that the primary care physician is one of, one of the single best sources for this information uh, in terms of making sure that the patients are really equipped with the right, uh, with the right insights in taking care of themselves and their families. Uh, I think we are coming up right on the end of our, the end of our time. So Jen McKenzie, I really want to thank you guys for joining uh, and the EHI team for uh, for facilitating this. Um, if folks want to continue the conversation, please feel free to reach out to us. Arcadia's contact info is on the screen. Uh, the Arcadia team will also be hosting a webinar on February 3rd, where we're going to be talking about strategies and tools around COVID-19 vaccinations. Uh, talking about stratifying patients, um, opportunities for patient engagement and outreach, communicating effectively there, um, and tracking all of that really important work. So definitely invite folks to join us for that, um, and feel free to reach out. Great. Thank you so much for such a wonderful program today, Anna. And if anybody has questions, please feel free to send them through, and we will pass them on to Anna and her team. And we hope everybody has a wonderful afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Thank you guys. Take care. Bye.